his only begotten son. Somebody had to pay the price. Somebody had to pay the price. Don't ever forget that. Freedom is not free. J.R., I bought a book. <clears throat> when I bought it, I, had, I sort of had you in mind. You had been studying some things about World War II. Did you ever hear of the Navajo Code Talkers? I got a book. It was set, there was a bookstore at the Grand Canyon, and it was written. There's a lot of Navajo people that still live in Arizona, New, especially New Mexico, um, Gallup, New Mexico. There is uh, there's a large group of Navajo Indians that are from that area. They had their they had a, every shop we went into. They had a Navajo radio station playing. And they were, the DJ was talking in Navajo. They're, they're preserving their language. But anybody who doesn't know what that is about is in World War II, the Japanese were breaking all of our military codes. They were breaking every one of them. They're very, very intelligent people. And there wasn't anything that we would transmit that was secret because the Japanese were just very, very talented at cracking our best codes and there was a certain man I don't know I haven't read the book yet but I know a little bit about the story and I think he had a friend or somebody he knew that spoke Navajo and he started listening to this man speak Navajo and he asked him he said what what is that you're speaking he said that's our tongue Navajo he said does anybody else speak Navajo? He said, no, there's very few people in, just in our community that still speak the old language of Navajo. And it gave him the idea of bringing in these Navajo Indians from around the Gallup, New Mexico, northern Arizona area and bringing them into the United States military and developing a secret code that was based upon the Navajo language. And so now, here's all, you can just imagine, these Japs are, you know, they're going, there isn't, there isn't a code that we can't figure out. And all of a sudden, for the very first time, they're hearing the Navajo language. They had never heard it before. They didn't even know what it was. And to, till the end of the war, the Japanese never cracked that code never did and uh, so I look forward to to reading that book uh, anyway your salvation is was pay, your freedom isn't free the freedom that we have in this country was bought and paid for by the blood of people I, I was blessed uh, in our in the the one day we spent in Los Ve in Los Angeles, I, I won't complain very much because part of the heavy traffic that we got involved in was along a certain on a certain highway. We didn't know it at the time, but they were bringing and they were having the funeral of one of the Marines that was killed in Afghanistan by the Taliban. It was one of the, what was it, 11 of our men that got killed on that day? And apparently that particular day, they were going to have his funeral. And we didn't know it, but we were on the highway that was the route that the funeral procession was going to take. And we probably went under at least a dozen bridges. And all of them were full of flags Patriots, people with motorcycles, um, people with Trump flags, you name it. And it was an honor to drive. Through. We didn't know what was going on until I saw a billboard that 
that showed that that man had passed away. And then I figured out what was going on and we just happened to be driving that route. And I, man, I laid on the horn every time I come up to one of those bridges. I let those people know that I was on their side. I was in, I was in favor of them uh, to celebrate the life of someone who has given his life uh, for his country. No greater love hath this than a man will lay down his life for his friends, the Bible says. And when a man will give down, lay down his life for his country, that's a big thing to me. And I appreciate that. Roy, you had something to say there. Yep. So there was over 20,000 guys. 20,000 20, men in one day. That's a, that's, a, that's a lot of letter writing from the uh, War Department sending letters home to moms and dads saying, we're sorry, but your son is not coming home again. Anyway, let's turn to the Gospel of John chapter 6. Good to be here tonight. Um... Man, I hate, to, I hate to announce this, but we will not be here next Wednesday night. Um, we, the Prophecy Road Show will be in uh, Delphi, Indiana. And um, uh, there is, I won't give names out because I'll let God bless them. But somebody uh, spent their own money promoting it on Facebook and they think they've got a lot of um, sort of returns on the advertisement. The address for where we're going to be is it's the uh, Rock Community Center. And the address is if you go to our, new, our newest website, uh, ufopastor.com, the address for that um, for that meeting is there on that website. Uh, let me give you an update on our church website. We are about 90% sure that our church website is kaput. Yeah. Um, we uh, ha have logged into it, but apparently most of the content has been lost. And since that's the case, we talked to, uh, I talked to Courtney today. We had a little meeting about it. And I've talked to somebody, um, I'm not going to give their name either, but uh, we will probably not use that company in the future. Now, we still own the web address BethelChurchMo.com. We still own that. That's ours. That's separate from the website itself that is probably not going to be in existence anymore from the company that destroyed it. They, it's their fault. They blew it. They lost our content. And um, so more than likely, we won't go back to them to host our website. But be looking in the future, the name BethelChurchMo.com is still ours. We own it. And at some point in the future, when you type in BethelChurchMo.com, it's going to take you to a brand new Bethel Church website that will be ours, is what I can say to you. I don't know how long it's going to take to get that back up online, but unfortunately, that's just how things happen. And uh, it's just one of many aggravations that the devil has thrown our way to try to thwart what we're doing. Uh, but if God's in it, the devil can't stop it anyway. Somebody say amen. So in the meantime, use uh, facebook.com slash Pastor Mike online for our streaming. Use sermonaudio.com slash Bethel for everything. Everything that this church does is on sermonaudio.com slash Bethel. All of our archive services, all of our live services uh, are streamed through there. Um, all of our 
notifications from Twitter are on that page, sermonaudio.com slash Bethel, B-E-T-H-E-L. And so um, go to that in the time. And here we are. We just got a new brand new church sign with BethelChurchMo.com. And that doesn't work anymore. <laughs> of course. So anyway, who's trying to get who's trying to get my attention? Let's see here. Yeah, yeah, I got you. I got you. So anyway. All right. John chapter six. Uh, let's begin reading in verse 22, shall we? And remember, we're working up to something in John chapter 6. John 6, 22, And the day following, when the people which stood on the other side of the sea saw that there was none other boat there, save that one whereinto his disciples were entered, and that Jesus went not with his disciples into the boat, but that his disciples were gone away alone. Howbeit there came other boats from Tiberias nigh unto the place where they did eat bread. Remember, he's fed the 5,000. After that, the Lord had given thanks. And when the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, neither his disciples, they also took shipping. In other words, they sent their boats out. They're going, okay, where is he? We're going to follow this man. We, we're hearing what he's saying. And you have to understand, Jesus came to set these people free from the religion that they were following of corrupted Judaism. It was not the Judaism that God gave Moses from Mount Sinai. It was corrupted. And Jesus came to set them free. And they're hearing words that no other rabbi had ever taught them. And they like it because they're seeing that it can set them free, can make them free. They're hearing the truth. And so in verse um, uh, 24 again, when the people therefore saw that he, uh, Jesus was not there, neither his disciples, they also took shipping and came to Capernaum seeking for Jesus. And when they had found him on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Rabbi, when camest thou hither? Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily. What does verily mean? Truly, truly. Think about, and let me give you this. John is the only of the four Gospels where Jesus says, Verily, verily. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, he always only says, Verily, I say unto thee. Now, I don't know what that means. But here again, once again, to me, it sets John apart. It makes John's gospel different. And if you do this comparison of like DNA where adenine, guanine, cytosine are the same in RNA, single strand, which is single strand DNA, RNA. You have thymine, which is different. The fourth one's always different. And John's gospel is different than Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So it's set apart by, number one, the storyline, number two, the way it's written, and number three, here's another way it's set apart. This is the one where Jesus says, verily, verily, truly, truly, I say unto thee. And I think the, the verily, verily part establishes what we've learned in the Old Testament, for God speaketh once, yea, twice, in a dream, in a vision of the night. That's what he said in the book of Job, in the book of Psalms, he said, God has spoken this. Twice have I heard this. And so it tells us that God speaks twice. So here is Jesus doing this twice speak thing by saying, Verily, verily, I say unto you, ye seek me, not because you saw the miracles, but because you did eat of the loaves and were filled. And then he's going to give us a lesson here. And understand this lesson. We're not the only church in the world that's feeding hungry people. We're not. We're not the only church in the world that has some form of charitable organization 
that gives handouts to people, whether it be clothes or food, a soup kitchen for homeless people or whatever. We're not the only ones who do that. Because we're not just interested in whether or not their bellies are full. But that is an interest that we have. Uh, I, I said yesterday that we're doing a feeding this week. I was wrong, been wrong about a lot of things this week. The feeding's not this week, it's next week. We're buying the food this week and we're going to do a feeding next week. We care about those people and whether they have food in their belly. But he said, labor not for the meat which perisheth. Now, does that mean to us that we should quit our jobs, not work, not try to earn bread, and just say, well, God's going to feed me? Does it mean that? Not at all, because I can show you scripture after scripture where God says, get up, go out and go to work and feed and provide for your family and take care of your family's needs and your own needs. I can show you where God told Adam, Adam, by the sweat of your face, you're going to eat your bread at night and you're going to have to deal with the thorns that are in the field along with it. You're going to have a hard, you're going to have a hard way to go, Adam. Multiple places where God tells us to labor for that food. But he's saying, labor not simply for the meat which perisheth. Don't just labor for the meat that perisheth. But for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. Now I'm going to make a comparison here, and, and if you want to accuse me of work salvation, you just go right on ahead. But Matthew, who earns the bread in your house? You're the primary breadwinner. Okay? Matthew doesn't have, Matthew saw his dad get up every day and go to work. He saw his dad go through the hard times, the easy times in the ministry as he was growing up. He saw all of those things. And Matthew learned that if he's going to survive as an adult, he's got to get up every day and he's got to go to work. He can't just sit at home, act spiritual and say, I'll let God feed me. That's tempting God, by the way. You're tempting God. You're saying, God, I am going to let you feed me. And it's like, God, if you don't want me to perish, then you better come up with some food. That's tempting God. It's the same way here. Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat. He's saying labor for the meat which endureth unto everlasting life. Who's going to read your Bible for you? Don't count on me. You and you alone are responsible for your salvation. I'm not. The church isn't. A denomination is not. The Pope isn't. Billy Graham's not. He's dead. Franklin Graham's not. This country's not responsible for your salvation. You and you alone must work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. That means that you have an assigned duty unto you to fulfill a role in the kingdom of God. And if I were you, I would do it. Because... You're not just laboring. I mean, you know, I don't want to be rude here, but when you eat something and you're working a normal day's work, that food in you is going to pass through in about four hours. And then you're going to need some more to follow after it. That food that you ate 
is going to perish inside of your body. It's going to be burned up in your cells. What's waste is going to be cast out into the draft. What little is left over is going to be stored as fat. If there is any left over at all, it's going to be stored as fat for maybe the night time or for maybe for the winter time. And it's, it's a proven fact. Every one of us, when it starts getting this time of year, we start putting on weight. It's the way our bodies are designed. We start feeling that cool weather, automatically our bodies start storing more fat to get us through the wintertime. It's, it's a known thing. But it also, when it comes to the spiritual food that you have to eat, whose responsibility is it? It's yours. It's your responsibility. Turn to Matthew chapter 6. By the way, this food doesn't perish. That means, John, that when you bought an NIV 20 years ago, and then you found out that the NIV that's out now is altogether different from the NIV that you bought 20 years ago, now you have to go out and buy a new NIV because the old NIV perishes. And they, don't, they no longer support the old NIV. So if you go to an NIV church, the pastor is going to be reading from the updated NIV and it's going to throw you off because it's going to say things that your old NIV doesn't say anymore. And you're going to have to get rid of it and get a new one. Whereas if you just stick with the King James, you will never have that problem. Amen. Matthew chapter 6, verse 16. Moreover, when ye fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear unto men to fast. I don't know exactly what they did, but somehow I get the idea that they go around going. Oh, he's fasting today. He's being holy today. Oh, let's, let's honor and praise that man because he is being holy unto God. Did you know that Hindus fast? Do you know that witches fast? Do you know that Muslims fast? So just because someone is fasting, does that make them some big close thing with God? No, especially not if they make it known to, every day, to everybody. And Muslims have a whole, I don't know how long Ramadan is, but Ramadan is this whole thing where from sun up to sundown, you can't eat a bite. When the sun goes down, you feast. But it's a whole thing where everybody knows that during the daytime, nobody's eating. And it's this, it's, it's this outward show of what they're doing and how spiritual and holy they're being before Allah. And God says, and I heard Brother John Uter preach that here. What was it last Sunday about you've already got your reward. You remember that? I was listening. I heard him say that. You, you've already got your reward. Because you let it be made known to everybody that you were going to be this way. Or you were going to be doing this. You've already got your reward. You got what you wanted out of it. Now, don't expect there to be any kind of glory waiting for you in heaven because you've already got your glory down here. I was listening. That was a good message. Moreover, when you fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. If you're going to fast, do it in silence. Do it in silence. Now, if somebody calls you up and says, hey, man, I'd like to take you out to lunch. 
I mean, it's okay for you to say, you know, um, I'm not trying to make a big deal out of this, but today's not a good day. I, I've got some issues I'm praying about, I'm fasting, and just, you know, today's not a good day. Maybe I'll be really good and hungry maybe by Thursday, but today's not the day for it. it I mean, it's okay to let some people know. But to announce to everybody, I'm going to fast, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this. You're already getting your reward. You're getting people to say, oh man, he is, he is so godly. Look at how godly he is. I want to, I want to tell a story that I, I've never talked about it openly. But it's, it's something that really, really disturbed me. And it happened at a church that I love the people of this church. I love them. Now, it's not this church, but it's another church that I have preached at. I have, been, I have been in fellowship with them. I have loved them. They've loved me over the years. They had one year, they, they brought in a, a young lady. She couldn't have been... 13, 14 years old. She was dressed very modestly, but almost, almost like it was too modest. It was like she was showing how modest she was. And she had certain instruments that she could play and she played them on the stage and then she had certain scriptures that she had memorized and she remember and she recited them in front of everybody and then she had a certain recitation that she stood in front of the church and recited something I don't know what it was but it lasted probably about 15 minutes her standing up there reciting this to everybody in the church. And I watched everybody when she got done walk up to her, shake her young hand. Oh, oh, you're so godly young lady. You're such a godly young lady. Oh, I was so blessed in all those things that you did. Oh, that just blessed my heart, all those things that you said. Now, maybe I'm being nitpicky, but her recitation, in my opinion, should have been disqualified from being done in that church. Let your women be silent in the churches. As far as her quoting memorized scripture, I didn't necessarily have a problem with that. But she was, in essence, she was kind of preaching to people. And I watched just everybody just go up to her and tell her, oh, what a godly young lady you are. Oh, you are just so godly. Oh, you just, and it was all about her outward appearance and the things that she performed in front of everybody. And her mother is the one responsible for parading her around from church to church to do these things that she did. And I may be wrong in this, but what I detected from this mother and this young lady was pure pride. Pure pride pride. Look at how godly I am dressed. Listen to how godly I speak. Watch how godly I play these instruments and recite these things. And I am good at this. And she got all the reward she's going to get for that. Now let me tell you something. That girl, and I don't know her, 
could have been harboring secret sins that no one knew about. But because she acted in an outward manner as a godly person, dressed in the godly uniform, saying the godly words, everybody assumed that she was a godly young lady and that all young ladies should be just like her. And I actually had somebody from that church come to me and say, Brother Mike, did you see that? Yeah. What would you think about that? I said, I, I'm, I'd rather not say. I'm going to keep my opinions to myself. They had a problem with it. And I'm just saying to you, I have been in fundamentalist churches all my life where the outward appearance meant way more than the inward man did. As long as, as, long as you were a, a female and wore a long dress down to your ankles, you were a godly woman. Didn't matter if when you got home, you were an absolute Jezebel to your husband. If you were a man and had, everybody look, my, I like my new haircut, I got it Monday. Boy, I couldn't wait to get back to get a, that haircut. I like my hair short to where you can't even hardly pull it. Every man got that hair cut real tight and they all wear suit and tie on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Sunday school, Wednesday night, revival meeting and visitation. And as long as they look that way, they are considered godly people. That has nothing to do with it. God told us that when Samuel went looking for the next king of Israel, he came to the oldest brother who stood way taller than everybody else, the handsome one, and said, I see him, God, I see him right now. He's the king of Israel. And God said, you got the wrong one. Let me tell you, Samuel, let me tell you what your problem is. You're looking on the outside. And I'm telling you, every one of these boys is not my pick to be the king of Israel, which caused Samuel to ask Jesse, you've got another boy, don't you, that you didn't bring out here, didn't you? I said, well, yeah, I got David, but he ain't nothing. Bring him out here, and we'll decide whether or not he's something or not. And that was the one that God picked. And again, I have been in conservative, fundamentalist churches all my life and have seen some of the most grotesque sins ever committed by human beings done in churches where all the ladies look godly on the outside and all the men look godly on the outside, but inwardly they are as corrupt as a rock and roll star. So he said, in verse 19, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon the earth where moth and rust doth corrupt. You know, I'd be curious, and I, and I don't wish this on that young lady, but I'm curious as to... It's been enough years to where she's probably at the age where she's at the, at the marrying age. I'd be interested in kind of knowing where she is right now. They promoted Josh Duggar 
all over this country as being like number one godly young man of the year almost. Who went around all over the country giving speeches at churches about how godly and wonderful his family was. And about how his parents taught him to live a godly life. In the meantime, he was hooking up with prostitutes using that app. And somebody broke into the database and found his name and published his name. And the number of times he had visited that website and the number of women he had paid money to hook up with. And this was, this was after a pastor got him up on the stage and said, People, we need to pray for this young man. Satan's attacking him. Why the, this ungodly world is attacking him and accusing him of all kinds of evil things. We need to pray for our brother that he stands true on the word of God. And then it wasn't but just a few days later that that list became public and his name was on that list. He had, he had been with prostitutes the week before. And he let, he stood up in front of churches and lied through his teeth about everything that had gone on. They have their reward. This is why I want a truthful church. Be truthful with God. Be open and honest with yourself because you can believe your own lies. I've done it. I've done it. You can believe your own lies. But be sure your sin will find you out. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon the earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For, there, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be be also. See, where did Josh Duggar get all that money that he was spending on that app? Where did he get all that money? He got it from that TV show. He got it from the speaking en engagements that he went around speaking all over the country. Where do the Rob Robertsons get all that money that they've got? How, how is it that they went from making little duck calls and all of a sudden now the whole, the whole family is worth multi-millions of dollars? They got it through that TV show. Now I'm not saying they're corrupt. I don't know anything about them. But I'm telling you, when you chase down the wealth and the riches of this world, it's corrupt and you're going to lose it. You're going to lose every bit of it. Luke 12. Luke 12. Verse 22, And he said unto his disciples, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life what you shall eat, neither for the body what you shall put on. Now I had somebody call me today. They're worried about, and I, I've been here, what, what's going to happen when all of a sudden they're going to require COVID vaccines out of everybody before you can even go into Walmart. What's going to happen? Is that going to happen? I don't know if it's going to happen. I have no idea if it's going to happen. 
But I, I've already seen the Walmart down in Hooterville, Arkansas. It's not really Hooterville, Arkansas. It's Clinton, Arkansas. And it's right, and I've been in that area before as a young man. I know it's all, it is, Clinton, Arkansas is Hill Billy USA. Because it's in the heart of the Ozark Mountains in, in Arkansas. And there ain't nothing in that whole area but Hill Billy's. Now, why Bentonville, the head office of Arkansas, decided to take this Walmart in Hillbillyville, Arkansas, Clinton, Arkansas, and on one day get rid of all of their cashier cash registers and change them all over to a self-checkout cash register and simultaneously say no cash transactions allowed, electronic payments only. Now, why they did that, I don't know. But I was there on the day that they did it, and I heard those hillbillies behind me cursing under their breath, cursing over their breath, and the poor Walmart employees trying to help all these old people out with computers. Have you ever helped an old person out with a computer? It's an impossibility. But it made me think, if they go cashless, who controls our cash now? Who controls our money? You see, right now, you've got a choice. You can pull, you, who said you had to have a bank? What law is there in this country that demands that you must have a bank? There isn't one. You can cash your paycheck and keep every, like, like String Bean from Hee Haw. Remember String Bean from Hee Haw? He did. He didn't trust banks, and he got killed because they had heard that he had stored all of his, now that he's famous, money inside his house. And it's true. They tore the house down and found $30,000 in useless cash inside that house. He got killed for that. Okay? But what's going to happen when they no longer take cash anywhere, and all of a sudden now... All of the banks are holding all your money, but you ain't got a vaccine. Or you ain't got something else they might require. Or you don't have this. Or you do have that. What is going to happen on that day? Let me tell you what's going to happen on that day. You're not going to starve to death. Did God let Israel starve to death in the wilderness? Elijah ate one meal... And it took 40 days for him to get not full anymore. He ate one meal and wasn't hungry for 40 days. Huh? No, it was catfish kettle. It was catfish, because I can do that on catfish. I sure can. John Uter knows I can. He's seen me do it. But anyway, look at what your Bible says. Take no thought for your life what you shall eat, neither for the body what you shall put on. Now, what did God just say? What did Jesus Christ just say to you? Quit worrying about it. Quit worrying about it. The life is more than meat. And the body is more than raiment. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which neither have storehouse nor barn. And God feedeth them. How much more are you better than the fowls? I will tell, I'll tell you something funny. We come home, and I saw the skinniest squirrels that I've ever seen in my life in my driveway. Now, here's why I'm saying that. When we were at the Grand Canyon, all the squirrels at the rim of the Grand Canyon were about that big around. They're fat. Do you know why? Because everybody feeds them. They're the fattest squirrels I've ever seen in my life. They're just like chubby, and they sit there, and they'll come right up to you and scratch on your pocket. Saying, come on, hand it over. We know you got it. Hand it over. Big, fat squirrels. And I come home and see them little squirrels that have to go out and get their own nuts. Felt sorry for them. 
Does God feed squirrels? Does God feed deer? God feedeth them, and how much more are you better than the fowls? And which of you, with taking thought, can add to his stature one cubit? Who can do that? If ye then be not able to do that thing which is least, why take ye thought for the, for the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They toil not, they spin not. And yet I say unto you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If then God so clothed the grass, which is today in the field and tomorrow is cast into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O ye of little faith? And how long did the shoes last that they wore when they came out of Egypt? Forty years. The tread of their shoes lasted 40 years. I've never had a pair of shoes last that long. For all these things, verse 30, for all these things do the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knoweth that you have need of these things, but rather seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell that ye have, and give alms. Provide yourselves bags which wax not old, a treasure in the heavens that faileth not, where there no thief approacheth, neither moth corrupteth. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Now he's not saying don't go to work. But he's saying, yes, you've got to work, but your life should not be just your work. The sum of your life should be the kingdom of God first. And if it's that way, God will put food in your stomach and clothes on your back, and he will never let you shiver. He'll never let the heat of the sun make you sweat. God will bless you, God will feed you, God will clothe you, God will do things for you that you never thought, that that, that you're scared to death. That if Biden signs some executive order, we're all going to die. Yeah, amen. Sign away, I'm going to heaven. And that's another thing, some of you on the internet... You're saying, well, they're trying to kill us all. Let them kill us. What are you, why are you so afraid of death? If you're born again, that shouldn't bother you. It should not bother you. 